Good evening, council members, uh, city staff, and members of the public. I thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity on behalf of Spokane Valley Fire Department to come in and uh, address with you a, a fairly significant uh, issue of interest to the community at large and also to the response community, your uh, police department, law, uh, law enforcement agencies from the region, fire service agencies. So tonight what I'd like to do is I'm going to cover a, a fairly um, significant amount of information and hopefully in a very short period of time and then have the opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of the presentation. The uh, presentation was uh, presented to our fire district commissioners a couple of weeks ago and they felt that it was uh, very informative and useful uh, from their perspective to understand what's taking place with respect to rail incident emergency preparedness in the community. So the collective goals that we have as a community and as a fire service, law enforcement agencies, first responders, is to avoid the unthinkable. Because if the unthinkable occurs, it is going to present a very significant challenge to your responders and to the community in general. But that's what we're tasked to do, is to prepare for the worst. And we also need to be able to react to the reality that is presented to us. And I want to start off just by stating that recent events with the shipment of Bakken oil, crude oil, from the North Dakota area via rail has created a significant amount of community interest and uh, angst in that they've witnessed some very significant events that have taken place in 2013 involving derailment of rail shipments and uh, very significant consequences to communities and the environment. And I want to caution you, though, that from a fire service perspective, we would much rather have the oil shipped via rail than via uh, overland transport on the highways. Preferably, we'd like to have everything done in pipelines. It's one of the safest means of transportation, but the pipeline capacity just does not exist. So our challenge is to avoid the unthinkable, to prepare for the worst, and react to the reality. I'm going to just give you an overview of rail transport through the valley. We're going to talk about commodities that are transported via the Burlington Northern and the Union Pacific Rail Lines, potential emergencies that may occur that we anticipate and that we try to prepare for, and then we're going to discuss the impact on the community and emergency services in general, and then uh, some discussion about preparation, response, and recovery. So rail lines going through the valley, you're all familiar with them. Most of you have sat uh, a fair amount of time at the railroad crossings awaiting the, uh, the trains to, to pass through. And uh, you know that along the Trent Corridor, you have the Burlington Northern Main Line, which goes between uh, Chicago and the Puget Sound region. It is a major uh, rail uh, corridor, and it's the northernmost uh, line for the Burlington Northern and has a lot of traffic. And then you have the Union Pacific, which uh, basically parallels the Burlington Northern until it gets uh, toward Millwood, then it crosses underneath the Burlington Northern Main Line, goes through Millwood towards Feltz Field. And you have a spur line that you'll notice in the lower left-hand qu quadrant of that slide. That is a spur line that goes down to Laytaw, Fairfield, uh, and points south in the Palouse. And that uh, is a line that uh, is uh, active uh, once per day. So some of the uh, information regarding these specific lines is that uh, we have approximately 65 to 80 trains per day traversing through the valley. Uh, most of the rail traffic is on the Burlington Northern Line, uh, in between uh, 50 and 60 uh, uh, trains going through. And then we have the Union Pacific in between 15 and uh, 20 or so trains per day. So this is a very active corridor uh, with some significant implications. And the Union Pacific Line is a secondary line that goes between Oregon and Canada. Uh, the maximum speed that you're going to see with uh, the rail shipments 
are going to be approximately 40 miles uh, per hour to the east of Pines and generally quite a bit less uh, speed to the west of Pines as they start to approach the, the rail yards in the Yardley area. And so uh, the, the length of the trains that we see going through are going to be anywhere from a half mile to up to two miles in length <coughs> for the, uh, the, the main lines that go through the valley. What are those lines carrying? What are the trains carrying? Well, you'll, you'll see a mix of uh, different types of rail cars. You have a lot of bulk shipment of uh, products. So you've got your coal, your wheat, your uh, fertilizers, and uh, other types of bulk products that are in the hopper cars. Your general freight, anything from Boeing 737 fuselages from Wichita going out to the Boeing factories to uh, auto shipments to general uh, merchandise in your uh, general freight cars. And your hazardous materials are the commodities that we are most concerned with because that's where we are going to have the biggest challenges in the event that there's an accident, a derailment. And when we talk about hazardous materials, we're talking about uh, a bad actors. And when I talk about bad actors, that means that if there is something that occurs and the product is released from the rail cars, then they, they act in a manner which uh, isn't really compatible for the general safety of the public. And so we are concerned with the compressed gases that uh, travel through the valley, combustible and flammable liquids. Uh, we're talking about our ethanols, we're talking about gasoline, we're talking about the crude oils. Toxic, corrosive, and poisonous liquids, which obviously are going to have a significant impact on the environment as well as the uh, life safety of uh, the citizenry. Flammable solids, which uh, present some uh, very unique uh, challenges to, to first responders. Oxidizers, which when they, uh, they mix with uh, uh, flammable products uh, can go boom in a uh, very rapid uh, period of time. And of course, we've got the explosives and then radioactive materials. So those are some of the commodities and the hazardous materials that tra are transported through the valley. And quite honestly, the Bakken crude oil is the the uh, product that is of significant public concern, but we've had products going through the valley for years and years uh, that are worse actors than the Bakken oil fuel. And your emergency responders, uh, you know, have tried to um, increase their level of preparedness over the years and making sure that we can deal with any one of these types of classifications. So when we talk about the safety and the history and, and regulatory aspects of rail shipments through the valley, we uh, basically have seen a market improvement in the uh, safety record of the rail transport industry specific to hazardous material shipments. So basically, uh, there, there's a very, very minute percentage of total shipments that ever will result in any product being released from a rail car. And the majority of the situations where product is released from a rail car is going to be in rail yards or is going to be during offloading or onloading a product. And typically, those are the types of uh, product releases which pose very minimal hazard to the general public. And so it's the, the catastrophic events which gains the media attention, and rightfully so. It's what took place back in Quebec back in June of 2013 in Alabama in November and then uh, in uh, Carrollton, North Dakota, to where they had some pretty significant events that uh, resulted in uh, significant media coverage and uh, loss of life and property. So since 1980, the number of incidents have decreased by over uh, 91%. So the safety record of the rail industry is getting better all the time. Part of that is because there is a significant amount of regulatory requirements that they have to comply to. And uh, the Federal Rail Administration is uh, one of the, the primary regulatory agencies. But with respect to hazardous materials, the U.S. Department of Transportation has significant requirements on the rail industry on how to uh, ensure that they transport hazardous materials in the safest manner possible, and then also emergency reporting requirements. And uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, as we will talk about in a little while. So then I'd like to transport to uh, some, uh, excuse me, transition to some of the uh, types of emergency events that we could expect to be incurred in the Spokane Valley area. 
The greatest potential is a low speed type of derailment with a small number of cars off the tracks and very minimal or no damage to the rail cars and the transport vessels. So that's going to be the greatest potential that we have. And those are things that we're very well equipped to be able to work with the rail industry, with our law enforcement partners, uh, to make sure that we can uh, mitigate the, the release of product into the environment and protect uh, the, uh, the citizenry and responders. And those types of situations are going to occur because of uh, potentially a train versus train accident or a vehicle versus train, and that's probably the most common frequency of event that we have that we respond to is vehicle versus train because we have uh, people that uh, disregard the, the crossing uh, guards and uh, they want to see if they can beat the train and get, uh, get on their way and unfortunately uh, they calculate uh, uh, in a manner that uh, resulted in it being the wrong decision and, and there's consequences. Or people that purposefully put themselves in front of a train and uh, we have a fair amount of those situations. And then we would move on to moderate to high speed derailment with larger number of cars and moderate to severe damage. These are the types of derailments that you see on the news to where you've got four, five, 20 cars that are off the track, you have significant product release, you have ignition, you have big fireball, you have a lot of media attention, a number of fatalities or property damage. The potential for that happening in the valley area is, is uh, fairly minimal. There is the potential, and it's typically going to be towards the eastern end of our service area, which goes all the way to the, uh, the uh, state line. But it, we do have the potential in the city of Spokane <coughs> Valley for that to occur. And then we have the potential damage to containers, uh, either a vessel which is overpressurized, product that's incompatible with the vessel, or you have two products that are reacting, which creates pressure within the tank car, and then you can have a failure of the tank car. Sometimes those failures can be quite catastrophic, and those are the ones where you see the big fireball going up into the air almost like a mushroom cloud. Uh, very, very infrequent that you have those types of events, but you could have uh, product release through safety uh, valves, and uh, they're designed to relieve pressure. We get product coming out of the, the valves. Uh, or you have foreign object intrusion, a car into the valving uh, of the, the, the tank valves at the bottom of the rail car or you have damage uh, because of uh, some object that's hitting the train. Or you have a valve malfunction. They're just not uh, operating as designed, and there's a release of product. Now, some of the causes of the emergency events that we experience, or that the rail industry experiences, of course, is going to be vehicle versus train, train versus train conflicts. Uh, but more often, it's going to be failure of brake and wheel axle assemblies. And uh, those result in the, the train not being able to roll over the, the, the rails uh, efficiently, heat buildup. And when you have heat buildup, you have deformation of metal. And when you have that taking place, then you have failure and you have a potential derailment. Valve and equipment failures. Again, as I mentioned earlier, in the types of emergencies, you can have uh, you know, uh, engineering failures. And that was, uh, is going to result in uh, a release of product. Uh, most often, offloading and loading of product. Now, we don't have a lot of offloading or loading of product of hazardous materials in the valley, but out in the West End near the tank farms, the, the, the petroleum <coughs> tank farms, there is quite a bit of offloading that will take place in that environment. We have a couple of other manufacturers in the uh, Spokane Industrial Park that would also do uh, offloading or loading, and there is the potential for uh, a failure of a system or human error and uh, resulting in a release. Rail switch malfunctions. Uh, anytime you have engineering, you have mechanical, you have the potential for a failure. <laughs> and then failure of signal equipment. And uh, even though they have rigid uh, inspection requirements and they have fail safes, uh, there is the potential for rail switch malfunctions and you get two trains that are in opposition to one another and a potential collision. Runaways. Uh, this is what took place back in Quebec. Uh, in uh, June of 2013, you had a runaway train that was unattended, a locomotive left operating, they didn't have all of the brakes set properly, it was on an incline, and uh, they had a problem, and the, uh, the brakes failed, the train rolled back into town, um, uh, over a mile, I believe, 
They had a significant derailment with large number of cars uh, that went off the track because the runaway was at about 63 miles an hour and uh, they had ignition, they lost a good part of their central business district and the loss of 47 lives. That was a runaway. Uh, excessive speed, so you have um, either a mechanical malfunction that allowed for, for the speed to be exceeded, the speed limit to be exceeded, or you had human error, inattention. Rail damage or maintenance deficiencies, and then of course, human error, unsafe actions, and that by far is the greater cause of accidents that are going to occur in the rail system. So the big motivator, I think, behind having this presentation tonight and the public angst with these unit oil trains going through Spokane Valley is a result of the, the derailments that have occurred uh, involving the Bakken oil, crude oil. It's a light, sweet crude oil uh, which has different characteristics than most crude oil that comes out of the Gulf Coast comes out of the Alberta oil sands uh, area. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of the Bakken oil, but more importantly, the type of rail cars that the Bakken crude oil has been transported in. Uh, we've, we've found some very significant deficiencies, and the government is taking uh, measures to uh, increase the, uh, the safety level as well as the rail industry. Because quite honestly, the rail industry uh, doesn't need the bad press, but the rail industry needs to keep their lines open. And uh, when you're talking about profit loss, they can't afford to have these derailments. And there's a lot of other implications on the bottom line if they have a derailment. So Bakken crude oil, what is Bakken crude oil? It's a sweet, light crude oil, which means that it has, um, it's less viscous than most crude oil. And it also has a product impurities that are in this crude oil that include methane, uh, butane, uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and uh, some other products which uh, make it a very significant bad actor. And the Bakken uh, range is in North, North Dakota and Southern Manitoba and Saskatchewan. That's where the oil is drawn out of the ground. There's not a lot of pipeline capacity. That's why rail shipments in the unit oil trains are taking place. It's a flammable liquid with a flash point that's below 32 degrees, which means that it's very easily ignited if it escapes from its uh, container. And uh, much, uh, much more easily ignitable than diesel oil or other types of crude. And it has very, very significant risk for rapid fire spread. That's what is a very significant concern to us and making sure that we can provide an appropriate level of safety to the public. And it is uh, very challenging for us to be able to extinguish. In fact, I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about the fact that very likely, if we have a significant derailment and a significant product release, uh, we are not going to be focused on extinguishing the fire. And I'll explain that in a few minutes. Uh, it's transported in 100 to 150 car unit oil trains. And uh, there's about one and a half trains per day that are traversing through the valley, and they anticipate that those trains are going to increase in frequency uh, in the not too distant future. Now, what they're transporting the product in are uh, what they've found to be deficient rail cars, and that the product is a lot more of a bad actor than they originally assumed. They categorized the product classification to be in a car which was designed for less volatile product products. The DOT 111 rail cars are very susceptible to failure in the event of a derailment or a vehicle uh, intrusion into the tank car. They have been involved in some very high profile accidents as I mentioned, Quebec, uh, Alabama, uh, significant environmental damage, not a lot of life, loss of life or property, but it was in an unpopulated area, but environmental damage. And then uh, a uh, Castleton, North Dakota in December of 2013 to where they had to evacuate the town. Thankfully the fire was out of a populated area. Single wall construction for large majority of the fleet and single wall construction, as, as you've seen with shipboard tankers, uh, those, those are a recipe for disaster if there's an accident. More susceptible to damage and product release, and there are significant initiatives underway by the industry to improve their fleet because, again, they can't afford to have significant disastrous events. So, uh, for instance, Burlington Northern has just um, uh, purchased 5,000 new uh, tank cars which are made of a heavier gauge metal 
and a steel, excuse me, and I think are double wall construction. The regulatory um, requirements are way behind right now. There's a lot of pressure to try to hold back regulatory requirements, but the government's uh, making a move to improve the safety of the transport uh, vessels that are going through our towns. And then there's other mitigation measures that they're taking with speed limits and trying to reroute trains uh, uh, away from populated areas. But as you would know, in this area, it's really hard for that to take place because there's really no alternative than going straight through the center of the valley and through Spokane. So when we talk about the rail companies and their interest in trying to um, prevent derailments, and, and they do have an economic interest in trying to do that. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts necessarily, uh, but there's also regulatory pressure. Uh, I went and I interviewed a gentleman down in uh, Vancouver. He's their hazmat coordinator uh, with uh, Burlington Northern. Had the opportunity to talk to him a couple of weeks ago. And I got some information from him that helps illustrate that the rail company has been trying to improve the infrastructure to prevent accidents from happening. And some of what's taking place right now is that they're making sure that they've got engineering measures that are in place to improve the ability to detect problems before they occur. So if you were to, to go along the rail line, you'd notice some boxes that are on either side of the rail line. And uh, they are basically acoustical and heat measurement devices that are designed to detect whether or not brakes or wheels uh, or axle assemblies are, are uh, overheating or failing, and uh, hopefully before it becomes catastrophic. So they have heat signatures, and they can pick up differences in heat temperature, but they also have acoustical uh, measurement to where they can pick up on uh, vibrations or grinding of metals, and uh, they are able to detect the problem. There's an uh, alarm that goes off in the, the cab of the, locom the locomotive. They will stop the train. They have policy that they've got to go out and inspect. They tie in with their Fort Worth uh, Network Operations Center, and uh, they communicate, and then they make a determination as to whether or not at a lower speed they can go into a, an area to where it can be repaired. So that's one of the, the engineering measures that they've uh, uh, implemented. And then something that's called positive train control. They have 23 variables that are monitored and transmitted via an electronic network uh, satellites to their network operation centers, but also to the, to the locomotives. And uh, they are measuring things such as detection of speed, whether or not a locomotive is unattended, i.e. what happened up in Quebec, and then whether or not there's uh, any conflicts with uh, signals, and somebody ran a signal, then alerts go off, and or whether or not they have uh, potential train-to-train -train conflicts, uh, you know, a collision avoidance uh, type of warning, uh, and a number of other uh, variables that they measure. So they also have the ability to shut down a train automatically from their network operations center. It's actually a fairly significant initiative that they've undertaken on the Burlington Northern, and I believe the Union Pacific. I have not confirmed that yet. And then we have rail monitoring. Uh, twice a week in the Spokane area, they will go out with a device that goes over the rail. They have electromagnetic uh, measurement that they take, and any anomalies in the rails uh, should be detected, and then they have the ability to get teams to go out, inspect whether or not the, the rail line needs to be taken out of service and emergency repairs implemented. And again, uh, I said they did that uh, twice a week with that, and then they do a visual inspection daily in this area, in a populated area, and uh, it's about two times the, what the federal re regulatory requirements uh, impose upon them. So they take it seriously. And then, as I mentioned, they have an operations center in Fort Worth that uh, is, is uh, uh, tied in with the, the trains and with the regional offices, and they're able to, to maintain almost constant um, system status management and awareness. And then they coordinate any emergency notifications and response. So I thought that it would be the local office that would be communicating with emergency responders. It's not going to be the local office very likely. It's probably going to be Fort Worth because Fort Worth actually has more data, more information than uh, what the local office may have. They also have the ability to give us uh, cargo manifest electronically uh, where in the past we had to get those from the conductor of the train. 
And so, you know, we had to look for the person that was running about as fast as they could away from the site of the derailment to try to catch them and get their, their cargo manifest. Uh, but now we can, uh, we can do that electronically. Our, our dispatch center would be in constant uh, touch with their, their network operations center. So it's pretty impressive stuff they're doing. And again, not because they're necessarily gracious, but uh, although they're good people, but also because the bottom line. They can't afford the, uh, the accident any more than the community can. Um, operational policies, they have crew resource management, they have rest periods, just like the airline industry or the maritime industry, but also they have a, a requirement that there will always be two people uh, in a locomotive, uh, i.e. they only had one person in Quebec. That person abandoned the locomotive to go to a hotel and thought that the train was left in a secure state, and that wasn't the case. Burlington Northern will not allow for their locomotives to be uh, staffed below two. Uh, train operations, we have speed limits, uh, brake setting requirements, uh, parking only on sidings, not on the main line because they have a, a derailment preventer on sidings. And uh, then they have trailing locomotives to, to help slow a train down uh, in the event that they need to come to a, a more rapid uh, stop. So moving on to what um, some of the impacts on the community and emergency services are. On the community, Obviously, it can have a very significant impact on life safety and or the environment and the economy of a community. We know that if there is a release of a hazardous materials product, we're going to have airborne toxins, very likely. We're going to have flammable and combustible vapors, which are just looking for an ignition source, and once it happens, we're off to the races. Uh, contaminated soil and contaminated water. And of course, that's uh, paramount to, to us in this area because of the aquifer, which is so shallow. So we're very mindful of the, the, the impacts that it can have, uh, as well as the economic disruption. Uh, there, there's, there's economic disruption to the rail line. It's uh, about a million dollars per hour if they shut down the main line. So if we shut down the line for emergency operations, it's a million bucks per hour if they have a derailment a million dollars per hour, but what about the economic disruption to our businesses because we're denying access to, to people to go in and, and conduct commerce. We're denying access to residential areas and the list goes on. So it has very significant potential consequences to the community and that's in addition to the traffic de uh, delays that occur and uh, I'd be remiss to say that uh, you know that does have an impact on emergency services whether it's law enforcement, fire, or EMS. Uh, trains uh, do have the ability to impact our response times. Emergency services, the impact on emergency services, first of all, if we had a moderate to a severe event, we are going to be stretched very thin, and, and that's all of your emergency responders. But we have many, many different scenarios to prepare for in the event of a derailment. We have the, the potential for fire, we have the uh, extrication of uh, people who are trapped in the, uh, in the, in the derailment. Uh, we have uh, the potential of hazardous materials release. We have to protect exposures. We have to evacuate large areas. And uh, we're going to have very limited resources and we're going to have to make do with what we have available. Potential uh, depletion of local resources. Without a doubt, if it's a severe derailment, we are going to exhaust all resources in the local area. But we do have contingency plans for that. Regional multi-agency response, command and control mitigation <coughs> efforts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the National Incident Management System, which ensures that we have unified command, that we're working with our partners in law enforcement, we're working with our partners um, in public works and city government, and uh, we are going to make sure that we have the ability to coordinate all of those resources. But it is going to tax us. Significant challenges with acquiring immediate resources. As I told you earlier, if it's a significant fire, we're not putting the fire out very likely. We don't have the resources to put that much water, that much foam on that uh, uh, burning liquid to ensure that we can keep it extinguished. Sometimes it's best to let it burn. We evacuate, we isolate, and we protect exposures. A uh, long-term, multiple-day event. This is going to be something that's going to impact the community significantly. And then what do we do to prepare, respond, and recover for communities? And the best thing that we can do for, as a community is make sure that the community, city government, responders participate in the development and review of the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan 
which is our local disaster emergency management document. And uh, you probably, well, you do have representatives that sit on committees that do a review of that uh, on, a, on a regular basis. But uh, if you have things that need to be added into that plan, then those are where you need to work with your law enforcement, with your fire agencies, and we can go in in a coordinated manner and try to see if we can enhance uh, that document to make us better prepared for these types of events. Making sure that your um, uh, city official and employees uh, participate in exercises. For instance, we have a tabletop drill that's going to be taking place in May of this year. We're working with law enforcement. We're working through the local emergency planning commission or committee, uh, which is comprised of governmental officials, responders, and private industry to make sure that we're well prepared to handle an emergency event involving hazardous materials. So in May, you'll be made aware of that tabletop exercise. It's in the preliminary stages. We're going to coordinate the development of that exercise. Therefore, we get to plant the, the event, the scenario, the simulated scenario within the valley because we want to practice, we want to exercise, and we'd rather that we do it here instead of giving it to Spokane because we're going to benefit uh, to a greater degree than they might. Uh, assistance in establishing shelters and post-event um, uh, citizen communications. That's in, imperative that we figure out where we're going to put people that are displaced because of this. Designation of re uh, representatives for the Emergency Coordination Center and the Incident Command Post. I'm going to need, uh, uh, very likely it's going to be fire that will be the lead in the Unified Command, at least for a certain period of time. And we're going to need my uh, counterparts in law enforcement. So I'm going to have their operational people there at the command post. They're going to send people down to the Emergency Operations Center. But we're going to need government representatives as well. And we're also going to need public works. We're going to need uh, probably uh, e economic development because there's going to be a recovery period. There's, there's going to be a significant level of involvement beyond first responders. We'll take the lead, but we're going to involve everybody. And we need representatives that have decision-making authority to be at the command post for the operational aspect and then at the emergency coordination center to make sure that uh, we can start planning for the longer term implications. And then uh, be prepared to sign a delegation of authority to the regional incident command team. We have a Spokane County incident management team in the federal classification, it's a type three team, and we will be asking for a delegation of authority so we can make decisions on acquiring resources, making decisions on evacuation, and that authority will be delegated for a very specific uh, <coughs> set of objectives to whoever is the incident commander of that incident management team. <coughs> and it's something which is done in disaster situations. And we can provide more education on that uh, later. I'm going to go over with the, the rail companies, but I wanted to show to you that rail companies have a big role in this. I, I'm not a defender of the rail companies, but the rail companies are viewed as a partner because they are essential in effectively managing an accident. They have to make sure that they're complying with all regulatory and risk management requirements. They need to make sure that they've trained their operations and hazmat personnel to the levels that are required under the regulatory environment, but also to meet our requirements for hazmat uh, entry and uh, being able to, to contain the product and be able to, to make repairs. Early notification uh, and uh, identification of the product. We stress to them, do not delay a response. Don't wait until it becomes a product that you can't handle. Uh, make sure that you notify us immediately if it crosses a threshold because we don't want to be behind the eight ball. Because you get behind the eight ball, we're all in trouble. And they work with us pretty well on that. But they also need to tell us what's involved. And then they need to make sure that they have pre-positioned uh, response equipment. They get that equipment on the road to get us up, uh, get up here to provide support for us. They have limited um, equipment in the Spokane area. It comes out of Pasco or Whitefish for the rail companies. But they also have contractors that work locally that can provide resources as well. And they have to have those contracts in place to make sure that they have immediate access to resources. But they need to make sure that they get those resources in route. Uh, also a retainer for hazardous materials response and recovery contractors, which I just mentioned. They are critical to being able to effectively mitigate uh, an event. 
and then designation of representatives from the Emergency Coordination Center and the Incident Command Post. And then uh, they have to be prepared to deploy national resources that can be mobilized from various uh, places throughout the country, but most importantly, they need decision makers that have a checkbook and are authorized to use the checkbook because we're going to spend a lot of their money. And, and we have working relationships to where they won't balk at the bill, they want to get it dealt with, they don't want to get in conflict with the, their incident command managers on the scene. So, uh, but we need somebody that has the ability to write the check. And they will mobilize a significant number of resources from elsewhere in the country. Uh, your oil pipelines and the rail companies are about as well prepared as any industry I've ever seen. They have spent $150,000 to do exercises up here on the pipelines and they bring in their incident management people because it's going to be a long-term event. And they practice, they train, and they spend the money that's necessary to be adequately prepared and to work with local responders. So I want to give you a level of confidence. That doesn't mean that they're perfect, but, but they do make a significant investment. Emergency responders, uh, our job basically is to make sure that we've got good plans, that we know how to execute that plan, that we get the appropriate level of information that's necessary to be able to get the right resources on the road to effectively uh, uh, mitigate the event. Um, and we want to make sure that we do everything that we can with our partners in, in law enforcement and EMS to isolate, evacuate, and, and protect exposures because that's going to be the, the mantra that you're going to hear over and over again is that we're going to isolate, deny access to the what we call a hot zone, and we're going to make sure that we, we get people evacuated and that we do the rescue and we protect exposures. But we are also going to initiate uh, what they call the emergency operations plan. Uh, they have a hazardous materials, what they call an annex, and there's very s uh, specific steps that we have to take for hazardous materials. We need to make sure that we've uh, identified the product, we've isolated, we contain and control. We have a hazmat team that is a mutual aid resource out of Spokane who have technicians who can go in those moon suits uh, if it's appropriate. And we train our people to operations level, they train their people to tech, uh, technician level, and then we work in concert with one another. And make sure that we initiate the incident management system, which is imperative and that we uh, coordinate, the, uh, we, we activate the Emergency Coordination Center, and then that we work with our local, regional, state, and federal representatives because it's going to be alphabet soup that's going to be involved in this incident. You're going to have the Department of Ecology. You're going to have the Federal Railroad uh, 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 Agency. You're going to have NTSB. You're going to have law enforcement, fire, EMS. The list goes on and on with the alphabets. And then coordinate with rail technical experts. Again, they are partners. We rely heavily upon their expertise. Then we go on to the incident management system. I won't bore you a lot with a lot of details, but the incident management system is a requirement for everybody to go through a certain level of, of training on how to work in a unified command. And that involves all of your first responders, and we practice <coughs> this regularly with law enforcement, with EMS, with our local hospitals. We practice less infrequently with, uh, with public uh, works, public health, um, but uh, the governmental officials are, are part of the equation when it comes to working at an incident command post or at the emergency coordination center, but it's expandable. So we, we take it from the, 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 the time of notification to the time that our first engine pulls up or law enforcement officer pulls up, and uh, then we just expand based upon the magnitude of the event and it is a very, very well-coordinated system to, to work within. Uh, establish incident priority strategies. We're going to develop incident action plans. We're going to make sure that we coordinate public information, media interaction. So in the event of a, an event like this, the city of Spokane Valley is going to be integral to making sure that we have effective communications to the public. So you will be at what we call the Joint Information Center. We're going to establish JIC. And JIC is going to work underneath the incident commander. We're going to have uh, representatives from law enforcement, fire, uh, the, uh, the, the, the feds, the state, Department of Ecology. But, but everybody's going to be together to make sure that we get a consistent, coordinated message out to the public so we're not all working at cross purposes. And then an orderly transition from, uh, of command from first responders to long-term agencies, the Department of Ecology and private parties. We are going to be there to mitigate 
the life safety and the property hazards that are immediate. And then at some point in time, the determination is going to be made to go to a long-term type of event. The Department of Ecology is going to be, be uh, uh, very big in this. The, the railroad is going to be big in this. But it may also be the city that's going to be very involved in the long term. Because now the community has to figure out how we're going to recover from this type of an event. And so you're going to have representatives that are going to be part of the incident command team long term as well. But you'll have a lot of resources that will provide you with, with assistance in walking you through the, pro, the, the, uh, the process. And then, shelter in place and or uh, evacuation. Again, in the emergency operations plan uh, for the county, we have an annex that's uh, called evacuation. Law enforcement has responsibility for evacuation. Uh, they are of uh, a significant uh, value in being able to make sure that they can get out and they can get neighborhoods uh, evacuated and that they direct them to shelters that we will try to pre-designate uh, as we make the evacuation. They need to work in concert with fire because we don't want to put them into uh, what we call the IDLH, immediate danger to life and health because they don't have the protection equipment. So we need to tell them where the, the, the line is for hot zone and warm zone and then they take care of everything in the warm and cold zone, we take care of everything in the hot zone. But we work in partnership uh, because we're at the same command post, we're making these decisions uh, uh, collaboratively. And uh, then we also would be coordinating with Alert Spokane, and that's that automatic notification uh, that uh, you know, will we'll dial up numbers within a given geographical area, and we can provide uh, instructions to the population as to what's taking place, where they need to go, and we may even tell them, just shelter in place, stay in your home, shut down the air conditioning, you know, put towels underneath the doors, and, and just shelter in place in, until we can secure the event. So, I've covered a lot of territory, a lot of information. I've been talking rather fast. Now's your turn to uh, ask questions. Questions from Council? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Chief Hale, for <clears throat> being so informative. That's a very technical subject, but I think it's on everybody's mind. I just have a couple questions. Um, I represent the city on the Emergency 911 Advisory Board, <clears throat> as Mr. Hafner did for many years. And I guess I have a basic question about communication. You know of the, of the funds that the citizens um, since 2008, the one-tenth to one percent funds. Is communication between the fire department and law enforcement and other first responders what it should be today if we had a disaster? Can you communicate very well? We do have the key, uh, capability to communicate uh, between law enforcement and fire, especially at the command level. The, the units that are out in the streets have the ability to, to communicate with one another. But, but their mission's a little bit different than, than the command staff. They are worried on, uh, you know, for my emergency responders in fire, they're worried on getting in, doing a size up, being able to assess what the, the level uh, of involvement of the product is, uh, what's this, the, the damage that's been incurred. And they would be focused on very specific tasks, as well as law enforcement, their first in officers. Now we get our command officers coming in, and so my battalion chiefs, uh, their sergeants, their lieutenants would arrive at the scene. Now they would have more of a need to talk um, agency to agency than our first responders getting to the scene. We do have the capability today to communicate. And it's not exercised as well as we would like to do and we work constantly to get better at this by doing joint exercises. But we do have that capability and with the new 800 megahertz radio system which law enforcement just put into into, uh, into play, uh, into service uh, very recently. Uh, when we go with 800 megahertz and fire, we will have far more capability than we currently have. But we do have the capability today, and as we develop protocols with 800 megahertz, we are going to have joint operational channels that are designed to, to deal with these types of situations. Okay, well, I, I know it's still in the testing phase in some areas, especially in the fire department but uh, you feel kind of confident right now that enough communication could take care of a major disaster. 
Absolutely. Okay. And, and even you. more importantly is that we have uh, representatives of all the involved agencies at the, at the command post, and uh, law enforcement in the Valley ha has been a very strong partner in, uh, in working in a unified command. And there's times when they're going to be the lead agency in unified command, like we, we had at the Valley Active Shooter Exercise, mm -hmm. where they, they are the lead, and then, then we provide support for them. And, uh, and in a lot of situations, it's fire that takes, uh, takes the lead, and then law enforcement there is, is our partner. And so uh, that's the most important communication is what's taking place. Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay. One, one other quick question. You mentioned one and a half or one to one and a half trains right now with the crude oil. What are you hearing about the future? How, how soon will we be able to expect that number to rise significantly? Well, since 2011, the, the number of carloads of Bakken uh, crude oil have uh, increased exponentially. And I think that they anticipate that those shipments are going to continue to, to rapidly increase because of the volume of product being produced mm -hmm. uh, at the wells and the need to get it refined, and uh, either for shipment or to the refineries. And so, with the West Coast uh, in the Peach Sound area having four major refineries and the potential for terminals to um, export the product, we anticipate that within the next five years we're going to have a significant level of increase, but I couldn't quantify that at all. Okay. Thank you very much. Councilman Hafner. Chief, the one question. Could you explain to all of us here and with the audience uh, the alert Spokane system? because I felt when that went into existence, it was really a, a boon for all of us. Maybe you could give more of a detailed explanation how that works. Well, a recent example that, that I can give to, to where I, I experienced it was uh, there was a, uh, there was a murder, uh, double murder suicide that occurred uh, down in the valley. And the suspect uh, was uh, living up in my neighborhood and they, uh, they had a uh, scenario to where um, he was in the house. They didn't know the status as to whether or not he was still alive or if he had, you know, committed suicide. And Alert Spokane was able to do a reverse 911, and I was able to get a phone call at my home to alert me that there was police activity and uh, cautioning residents to, you know, stay in their homes and stay away from a particular geographical area. In the event of a derailment, we would identify the immediate uh, danger to life and health um, area uh, based upon wind direction and so forth. We would plot out on a map uh, a, a radius, and we would go and uh, tie that into the alert, uh, the alert Spokane system, and they will, uh, in a computerized manner, be able to identify all of the phone numbers that exist within that geographical area and make a phone call and provide a message to the, the, the person on the other end of the line as to whether or not we want them to immediately evacuate and to avoid such and such a road and a shelter um, uh, will be at uh, X location. So basically it's a reverse 911 and we can get uh, law enforcement uses it I think a little bit more frequently than we do, but uh, we've, we've got the ability to communicate to the public in a very rapid manner. Okay, that was also one of the items on the one tenth of one percent that came in in existence. Was that reverse nine one one? Is there anywhere now? Do cell phones and land phones all operate, or is there a problem with that? No, you do. Uh, you do have the ability to have your cell phone registered now. You have to. Uh, I, I would type in Alert Spokane. I wish I had the information specific here, but type in Alert Spokane into a search engine, or get on the uh, Department of the Emergency Management web page. And um, you would be able to get instructions as to what you need to do to register your cell phone. But you need to register your cell phone. And I believe the phone company uh, has an automatic, uh, they have a database for landlines, and that's automatically uh, registered, I believe. I'm not absolutely positive on that, though. And that's what I wanted to get at, because you have to register for it in order for it to operate. So that's important. Anyway, thank you. Chief, thank you very much for this very, very important uh, report this evening. Thank you so much.